Okay, very good, great. Uh, welcome everybody to the very first podcast of uh, What is Public History? My name is Susan Smith-Peter and I'm a professor of history and the director of the public history program at the College of Staten Island, which is part of the City University of New York. And uh, I'm really excited to be here together with two of my colleagues. Uh, Assistant Adjunct Professor Joseph Frucci, who will be talking about how public history can be applied uh, in the secondary uh, school level. He's also, he's also a social studies teacher in addition to being an adjunct professor with us uh, and also uh, our former graduate student, our graduate, uh, Carlos Santiago, who is a working public historian and someone who has a lot of really exciting experience on the ground and can bring in a lot of, uh, you know, personal experiences, community experiences and public history experiences more broadly. And of course, you know, I've been teaching public history for a while and I can bring in the academic side uh, and the experience of what it's like uh, in the academy. So the idea of the podcast is to bring together these different perspectives in the academy uh, in high schools and in the field itself. So we wanted to start by talking broadly about what public history is. Maybe you're listening to this because you've just heard about public history, you're kind of curious, uh, maybe you've been doing public history for a long time. Either way, uh, this podcast is about introducing you to ideas about public history and how different groups uh, and practitioners experience public history. And one of the important people in the field of public history is Thomas Coven, who is uh, the author of the textbook on public history and has played a lot of important um, sort of roles in the public history field. And we thought it would be good to play upon his three ideas of what public history is that he's spoken about in his own work and his own uh, presentations, uh, which is history for the public, history in public, and history with the public. So I want to start talking about uh, how public history is history for the public. Right, and this is, in some ways, this is the least uh, unusual, the least different of, of any of these types of history because even academic history is also in some ways history for the public because academics always hope to reach the public. Uh, we're always saying, oh, this book will reach the general reader, whether that actually is true or not is an entirely different question, but that's, that's always a hope that academics have even when they're writing monographs. But with public history, you know, it's history for the public. And there's so many different things that public history can do for the public. And so I just wanna uh, open it up to my colleagues here and, and talk about when you think about history for the public, what, what comes to your minds? You wanna take this one first, Carlos, then I'll jump in. Yeah, sure. I can I can definitely contribute on this end. Um, you know, for those that don't know, I have a, a extensive experience with uh, digitization. Um, so my particular like area of expertise and um, kind of like my background is pretty much for the public. Um, I used to work for a genealogical um, nonprofit, the New York Genealogical and Biographical Society. And like I said, I, you know, I, I was um, working on digitization and this theme of for the public pretty much applied at all times. Um, you know, if someone from Texas or from California or from even as far as England and Scotland, um, everyone has, you know, a family history of some kind. Um, whether or not it was documented to the extent that we think is a whole completely different, uh, you know, beast in itself and requires research. But, you know, overall, everyone has a family history. Um, so in the theme of, of for the public, for public history, um, I was kind of like the intermediary in that I had documents that people wanted. Um, and it was up to me to make it accessible to them through digitization and through using um, internet tools to try to upload them and, and put them onto a website. 
Um, so my kind of form of public history, which involves, you know, digitizing writing and, and other aspects and archiving, um, you know, the for the public is pretty much what what I do intimately. Um, and sometimes I think the aspect that isn't talked about enough, and I'm sure Susan, you can, um, you can relate is sometimes uh, our work is done for the public. Um, but the public is not aware of it. And mm. that's perfectly okay. Um, because our job is to preserve it and to um, continue telling stories that will help people appreciate it. And thus, you know, as you get the attention, there's, you know, more calls for preservation. So, um, yeah, I can say that that's part of um, what has driven my career thus far. And I, I think uh, Joe has a has a, a perspective that kind of fits in between both of us. Yeah, I do. Uh, it's interesting. So this conversation is making me think back to when I was a grad student in history. I was also doing an internship at the Conference House, which is um, it's a historical site here on Staten Island, for those that may not be aware of it. And a peace conference took place there between Lord Thomas Howe, and who was representing the British, and you had Thomas um, Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, and Edward Rutledge for the Americans, and a peace conference took place there on September 11th, 1776. And I used to give tours down there doing some interpretation. And what's interesting is that many people that would come there, because it's also a, it's a public park that people can go on to and, and hang out, and they'd come and ask for a tour, and they had no idea that A, the historical site existed, and B, the history behind that site. So it was very interesting to see them learn this for the first time. And when I transitioned into the field of education after grad school and now teaching history, the secondary ed level, we would then do class trips there and students got to see what doing history for the public was. They got to see those historical reenactments. They got to walk the historical site and kind of take it out of the classroom. It, it's one thing to read about these events in a textbook or look at pictures, but to then walk the path that uh, historical figures that I had mentioned walked and see what life was like at that time, it hits very differently. And it's that doing history for the public and in, it's bringing history alive and making it very relevant for you know, today's society. And it's nice to know that you have this piece of history in your community. And as I said before, it's great when they really figure out, oh my God, this has been here all this time. I've lived here for so many years and I never knew it. And I've seen some people that sparks an interest. And then they start taking interest in things like, well, wait a minute, I know we have historic Richmond town. How is that different from the conference house site? And it leads them down this path to really understand the history of their community, which essentially is bringing us into that realm of public history. Yeah, I think that's that's really interesting what you're saying about things that are discovered, uh, things that have not been known before. I mean, I've been working on the history of, of Russia and Ukraine for 20 years. And just recently through Twitter, uh, I met someone at the Ukrainian uh, History and Education Center, which is in New Jersey. And I went there and I met him and I just saw this incredible collection there. And the ironic thing is I used to live in Jersey and I would always turn off um, 287 just in the opposite direction, <laughs> right? So if I turned left instead of right, I would have seen it. And there it is, this incredible mind boggling collection of, of material with that's so relevant to so, so many different things. Like they have this incredibly beautiful, uh, large number of watercolors of um, Ukrainian ethnographic materials like uh, uh, drawings and uh, you know uh, embroidery and so on and so forth. But yeah, there is this this question of how do you get if you're doing work for the public, 
you know, that's all great, but how do you get it in front of the public? Because anybody who has actually tried to start a conversation and get engagement going knows that everybody in the world is out there on Twitter, they're out there on Facebook, they're out there on every platform, and they're trying to get engagement, they're trying to get people to get involved. And sometimes, you know, the the public doesn't know about it. Sometimes they're they're not interested in it. Uh, what do you think is especially necessary to to you know just simply make the public aware of the things that are out there? It's a good question and a very challenging one. I mean, you mentioned Twitter, and it's very hard to gain any traction <laughs> on there. And it's easier to get things out in the digital world than it is in the physical world. So it's double the challenge to make people physically aware of what they have right around them and kind of bringing this to them. That's, that's a great question. Uh, outside the classroom, my experience would be doing historical tours and interpretation. But other than that, outside the classroom, I'm extremely limited in it. Uh, for me, it, it's, it's trying to get that spark ignited for the kids in the classroom, which hopefully can lead to something outside. But that's that to the extent that I have the experience with. What do you think, Carlos? Uh, it's a very, it's a very tough question to, to tackle because I've, I've very much asked myself the same thing. I mean, once you really think about it, the public is so broad. You know, the just the term public is so broad. Um, so I've genuinely had to, um, you know, wrestle with this idea by. Um, kind of thinking about that every single person is different and every single person is a part of an audience. I think, you know, through Twitter, through social media, through YouTube, through all of these mediums, uh, we've, we determined that people are into certain things and everyone is a part of their own niche group, whether it's regarding music, sports, um, and, and things like that. Um, and I think, for us, it's actually more important um, to focus on what we can do on a day to day. Mm -hmm. um, and Joe, you are, you know, intimate in this when you, you know, are talking about your students and you too, Susan. So, you know, you guys have a, a different level of interaction when it comes to speaking about history. Um, I don't necessarily have the space for that thus far it's it's mostly been the the public telling me their stories um but when it comes to how i educate in my community and just on my day to day um it comes to questions like you know what what are you interested in what are you passionate about um what's bothering you um what makes you feel good about your community um you know, what are the problems? And as you kind of ask those questions and you have regular, ordinary kinds of um, conversations, you start to see opportunities, um, you know, to present history to someone in a way where they can see it a little more clearly. Because um, sometimes history is very hard to see. Um, even with, you know, a, 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 a smartphone and, you know, a computer, we can get pretty good images, but it's very hard to imagine it. Um, and I think I have a decent example that kind of flows into, you know, the in the public uh, theme of, of all of this. And that's um, when I created my War of 1812 uh, themed walking tour of Buffalo, New York. Uh, the the main thing my professor uh, Carol Emberton told me uh, up at SUNY Buffalo was like, what are you trying to evoke? What are you trying to tell people? Because um, a lot of people, you know, in the U.S. don't know what the War of 1812 is about. Um, you know, they're familiar with the revolution, but that's about it. Um, but then again, how am I going to get someone to feel this or to understand this? Um, and the way I imagined it is, well, you know, we live in a world uh, that focuses a lot on identity. Um, so how are people going to identify with this? So I 
took this topic and I said, well, how does the War of 1812 reinforce what it means to be an American person? And how does that affect us today? Um, and similar to uh, what, what Joe mentioned, like a lot of people are like, wow, I never actually thought of it that way. I never thought that something in, a, in a di what seems like a distant past is actually impacting me right now. Um, and they didn't see the importance of it until I was actually in the public trying to have this conversation. Um, and to be honest with you, being a public historian is not easy because um, we're constantly in kind of battles between who has the expert opinion. Because um, right now, a lot of authorities on science and on scientists or um, you know social scientists um, we don't necessarily have our own spotlight where we can actually um, talk and have our full um, kind of range of expressions and, and expertise into things. But yeah, it, it really takes getting into the public and knowing that everyone else has a completely different you know, thing to share from a different perspective. It makes us sharing things harder too. But mm -hmm. yeah, you know it's a hard question. It's, it's the, what, what you're also saying is making me think of what we do in the classroom is, you know, when we're introducing something new or we want to reach the students, we try and make it relative to, the, to them, right? Mm -hmm. We try and meet them where they are in a way that will pique their interest. So kind of frame a question or frame the content in a way that the students can relate to. Um, you know, we try and meet them where they are. So for example, in, in putting work out there, you know, there are ways in which we try and incorporate things on social media to try and, you know, pique their interest and then bring them in with it. So I guess we can take that same concept. How can you get people to identify with this, to have them relate to it in some degree and then bring them in? What do you think about that, Susan? Yeah, I mean, I think that that's, that's a, a way to do it. Although I have to admit when I was in K through 12, I often got a little bit tired of the, uh, you know, identifying with this mm -hmm. thing because sometimes it can be a little bit, um, it you gets know. cheesy at times. It gets real it can, cheesy at times. It can be yeah. cheesy. I definitely yeah. remember a lot of 100%. cheesy things that were in that. But when it works, it, it really does work. Uh, and so, you know, I guess it's worth doing to kind of like hold the cheese, <laughs> right? Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm also thinking, and this has kind of come up in some of the other things that both of you have said with tours, is that there's an interesting uh, difference between for the public and in public, because in public is a space, yeah. right? right. And a public in that sense is like a public at, um, and this is something I've written about when I've written about uh, civil society in Russia, uh, 19th century Russia, the old use of the term public, publica, was like an audience, a literal audience, like in a theater. And you can still hear that even in English with like a celebrity would say, I don't want to disappoint my public. They don't mean like every single person in the public, right. they mean their specific audience. And so in public kind of gets at that, that place-based situation where you are reaching people in a specific space. Now, now with Zoom and everything, it could be sort of a virtual space, right. but it's not everybody. Uh, it's those people in that space. And, you know, that's, that's an interesting question. I mean, Joe and I have been working on a project where we collected uh, blogs and photographs and all sorts of reflections on the experience of uh, lockdown um, on Staten Island. So, and we're hoping that it was originally on Facebook and we're hoping to turn that into an actual exhibit at historic Richmond town. And I've been thinking about, you know, the differences that, you know, the differences that will occur when you take something that had been online, you know, that had been in that infinite scroll, you know, that Facebook is, uh, and how that'll be different when it's actually in a physical kind of space where it'll be in public instead of for the public. Um, and of course, with in public, you have, 
a lot of advantages because you can actually have that group, you can have that kind of electricity of people in the same space. But of course, you know, what if people don't come to the space? Or, you know, what if you have a walking tour, nobody shows up, very few people show up, or it rains, or all these other kind of things. So, so I guess, you know, I guess my question is, you know, what, what are the differences between, you know, in public and for the public? I mean, what, you know, maybe what projects too are especially well designed for in public and which ones are especially well designed for sort of a, a large uh, for the public? Like for the public, it almost makes me think of PBS, you know, mm -hmm. when they're trying to think of like the largest right. sort of what is the lowest common denominator, uh, I mean, in the good sense, right. uh, American history that the vast majority of people can agree on. And then in public, it's you're gonna have quite a different kind of group. Like the people that would come to Joe and my, you know, uh, exhibit, it's gonna be smaller. They're gonna be almost all Staten Islanders because as you know, people who are not from Staten Island do not come to Staten Island. But in any case, since the, the exhibit is about Staten Island, I don't think it's gonna be a problem. But yeah, I mean, what do you, what do you think about that? Uh, either of you, what do you, what do you think about, um, you know, the, the differences between those two? You know, when I think of, you know, when we look at things like for public, in public, it brings me back to the classroom in a way, but you brought up something interesting with the exhibit that we had uh, prior to what's going to happen at Richmond Town, but at the Museum of the City of New York. Mm. All mm -hmm. of those um, those photographs that were collected, and you had a couple in that exhibit too, mm. and that was something not only done for the public, but done in the public. Right? We were we were capturing life in real time at this certain point in our history and then it was put on display so it was done in public and then put on display for the public to see and from what i read that that exhibit for the time it ran had a pretty good turnout in in terms of people that showed up to see it i don't know if you you read any of that stuff susan yeah i mean i know that it had a tremendous response in terms yeah. of people submitting. Uh, and I think they did at the closing ceremony, I think they did say that it, it was a really amazing result. I don't remember the numbers. I'm not so good at numbers, but uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, what do you think, Carlos, in terms of the two? Uh, I think you guys separated it pretty well because um, it's, you know, I, I'm struggling with an in and with at the moment. So honestly, I'll go with defining what it means to be with the public, because um, I think, or at least how I'm imagining it, is um, a group of people, you know, pulling on the same thread towards, you know, remedying some kind of problem in the community, um, whether it's fundraising for a public history, you know, site or um, bringing awareness for a particular issue, like maybe renaming a park or um, taking down a monument, you know, things like that, uh, which is very much, you not only have to be in the public, but you have to be actually actively working with the public uh, to try to, um, you know, fix any problems that you want to fix. And one of the Probably the marquee example that I have in my neighborhood is that we have the MTA um, bus depot here on 126th Street. I live in, in East Harlem, for those that don't know. And on East 26th Street, there's actually a African burial ground um, from Africans um, that were enslaved and brought here. And I think some of the, the periodization is... Um, like, I think that that burial ground was established in 1668 or something wow. amazing like that. Um, and there's a bus depot basically on top of it. Um, and there's actually, believe it or not, kind of like the, the geographical humor of everything. The uh, L, I think it's called the Elmendorf Reformed Church is literally on my block. Um, and they've kind of been leading the charge of um, trying to bring awareness to 
the fact that there's a bus depot in a place that actually needs to be preserved and memorialized and needs more stories. Um, I remember in, in 2019 or early 2020, there was like a kind of public exhibit that they put, I think, or around Park Avenue. Um, so there's been a lot of movement there. I've personally tried to get involved, but it was hard because it was during the pandemic and a lot of the construction budget things were starting to halt. Um, so I didn't actually go out there and try to, to help out, but I'm looking to contribute to that. Um, but in thinking about with the public, that's, you know, what I, what I can relate to, or at least think about. So yeah. that, that site has an actual bus depot on it. I mean, how did they discover that it was a burial ground if there was a bus depot on it? There was, uh, I'm, I'm not 100% familiar with the story. It's, you know, some archaeologists I actually managed to do some work there and found um, remains. So um, that is not a, a uncommon. Actually, the year before I went to um, the University of Buffalo in 2012, there was a very big excavation on the South Campus, which is where I ended up living my first year. And there they found the remains of a whole bunch of people that used to live in the, the alms house that used to um, basically occupy that area before it became um, the University of Buffalo Medical School, which is how it started in, in um, 1848. But it's, it's yeah, it, it's, it's a lot of archaeology and a lot of methodologies that personally I'm not familiar with, but, you know, they actually played a really big role in, in you know, putting that out there and, and people, you know, took it to heart and wanted to do something about it. And the fight doesn't seem to be over. Yeah, I don't, I don't even know if this is the right time or place to mention this, but I have been interested in that burial ground for a while uh, because actually um, my ancestors owned enslaved peoples in Harlem. Uh, oh, so wow. there, yeah, so there could be, you know, actual kind of connections in that burial ground there. Um, you know, their plot of land was uh, 122nd and uh, I can't remember exactly what the avenue was, but but yes, um, and, you know, and learning about that it was very kind of disturbing for me. Right. Um, and when I read about the uh, burial ground, I thought, well, you know, that that sounds like something that, that could be something important to to work on. Uh, you know, so if if that is something that you're working on. Actually, it, it would be something that I would be interested in getting involved in as well, um, perhaps from a very different, you know, point of view. Uh, I mean, not that I'm taking the same point of view, but I mean, the reason why I want to work on it would be basically some kind of reconciliation, which I, I have to admit, I don't even exactly know what, what form that would take, but certainly given that I have been teaching these kind of subjects and I've been teaching, you know, how to commemorate slavery and how to, how to think about it. Um, and then with this strange personal connection that comes in there as well, it seems, you know, almost like it's something I, I really should do. So. No, I think honestly, we, we should plan to talk later on um, in, in a different way about this, because I genuinely do want to get involved. I haven't really reached out to anybody, at least not yet, but I definitely do want to be a part of that because um, it's it's really important. And I've been, you know, working in the in the family history world for, you know, three years was very eye opening for me. Um, because, you know, a lot of the folks there um, that are trying to, you know, genuinely look into their family history, they're not looking to be challenged. Um, they're more so looking to find comfort in the past. Um, they're not looking to look at the past for what it was. They try to look at the past for 
you know, the moment that their ancestors were here and what they contributed. Um, but, you know, among a lot of the folks that I, I came across, um, you know, topics of slavery uh, or topics of, you know, any kind of minority was very difficult. Um, but I think, you know, your, your effort and, you know, your, your desire to want to reconcile this and actually, you know, face it head on is really important. And yeah, I'd love to be a part of, um, you know, trying to tackle this thing from different perspectives too. Um, cause we need that as well. Um, you know, mm -hmm. it can't just be, you know, the black and brown folks pulling together. We can achieve a lot, obviously, but you know, the more people from different backgrounds that can really understand why this is being done um, and why it's important, you know, you, you can get pretty far, um, especially in, in a community like mine that is relatively poor compared to the rest of the city. Mm -hmm. And that really does need need some help with housing and and um, among many other things. So, um, yeah, no, I, I think it's important to um, emphasize this because this is part of being with the public is we have to have these conversations. Yeah. And, and what you say about comfort is really interesting because <clears throat> my mother's side of the family, the story that we always heard was that, you know, they were German farmers, they came over in the 1740s, and then they went west as, as soon as they possibly could. And then I started looking into it. Well, they came to Barbados in like something like 1610. I mean, there's no way they weren't involved in slavery. And then they went to um, Virginia and you know they got some sort of land from Lord Fairfax and, and George Washington surveyed something, you know, their property. And I'm like, it is impossible that they were not involved with slavery. Uh -huh. It's just simply impossible. And yet that was it was never part of the discussion. And even the George Washington part was not a big enough enticement to even, you know, raise the issue. Uh, because one would think that if there was some kind of connection, you bring it up. But it's a, it's um, it's almost like it's better to not e don't even go there. Washington or not Washington, we're not going to talk about Barbados, and we're not going to talk about Virginia. Uh, we can talk about Indiana and Ohio because those those are sort of safe topics. But you know, no, those those other ones we're we're not going to talk about. But yeah, so I think that that's that's this this kind of issue. And I have to admit, you know, the idea of working with the public in this context, you know, it's 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 a little. You know, I have to admit, it scares me a little bit, but um, I think that it's important. Uh, and I think that, you know, uh, if, well, bluntly speaking, if white people aren't willing to do this work, we're in for a lot of trouble, you know? Right, <laughs> um, right, yeah. Because, you know, all of those people with with these old names like Demaris, which is that the family and, and Bleeker and Stuyvesant, I mean, they're all involved with slavery. Right. All right. Of them. You know, New York was, you know, all of these kind of old, old names. Um, but, you know, you look at how it's discussed and only very recently has it been discussed uh, as being part of, you know, kind of a, a slave kind of system, you know, economy or otherwise. But, yeah. Um, anyway, yeah, I. I have to admit, it's it's a it's a difficult topic. It's not one that I was really thinking about talking about this time. But I guess it's it's part of it's part of being real, you know. Yeah. yeah no. Absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. I have a question for you, Joe, because um, it, it it relates to what Susan was saying just now, and that's like, you know, you're working with high schoolers and a lot of what they consume is seen quite literally and figuratively through a filter, whether mm -hmm. it's, you know, an algorithm or things like that. And how is it for you as a teacher? Um, like, how do you tackle preconceived notions uh, about certain topics? Um, 
and how do you kind of um, find a way to discuss it in a way where a student or a person is involved in the conversation. Um, Cause I think a lot of folks, especially young folks too, um, have this fear of being wrong. Um, right. And that can be, you know, even on social media, like nobody can be wrong. Right. Um, Cause everyone wants to lash out even if they're wrong. Um, so how do you tackle that in, in trying to teach discussion and debate as a skill rather than, you know, a, a kind of shouting contest? That's a great question. Uh, so it, it, it comes in, there's two sides to it. The first is your classroom management. You have to set the tone from the first day and let the students know that all questions, all perspectives are welcomed and they will be discussed and debated. Uh, you will not put another student down for a, a position he or, he or she may not hold. You have to just, you know, we have to talk this out. And I have to say the school I'm in, I'm very lucky because the students are very respectful at the high school I'm in. But one thing that I love, and it's been around for a very long time, Socratic seminars. Mm -hmm. And I believe they are a great tool. You know, you put a question out there related to the content you're covering in the class. Now, a high school classroom is rich in content, limited in research. So, mm -hmm. and when they come to college, you find that, Susan, you can attest to this all the time, you know, the students may or may not remember the content from high school, but teaching them those research skills, it's, it's sometimes pulling teeth. It's just a concept that some students just can't grab. But I believe the Socratic seminar is very good because you put a question out there related to the content. And I did this during the pandemic. We talked about monuments because that became a very, very hot topic to discuss. Mm -hmm. And students, I, I felt it, it, you know, it's very easy to say, well, let's just tear down this statue of, of Teddy Roosevelt because he believed in you know, eugenics and he's got a, a, an African-American and a Native American looking like you know sitting you know standing below him and he's perched up on a horse and and that's just not you know politically or socially correct anymore but I think it's important giving students the primary sources of that time to read over and understand put it into the historical context and understand the rationale at that time why these monuments may have been erected uh you know, a lot of the, the Civil War, uh, Southern Civil War generals, the Confederate generals, their statues were coming down in the last couple of years. And a lot of the students were able to point out that why are we taking them down because they owned slaves? And as we were just discussing, you know, this was a very common practice going back at this time. Why can't we just take them down because they were traitors? And this was a question that mm. came up in the classroom and it was discussed. Uh, but then another student had brought out the fact that, well, look at the time frame in which a lot of these statues were erected from, you know, the 1880s to about the 1920s. And now it's like, okay, what was going on in America at that time? And now you're really putting it into historical context, understanding the rise of segregation and how that gets, uh, you know, solidified, so to speak, via a Supreme Court ruling of Plessy v. Ferguson, where separate but equal is okay. And that's what kind of those statues were in a way representing to some degree. Uh, so getting the students the primary sources, they have the content from classroom instruction, but every Friday was our Socratic seminars. And the whole week, they're geared up towards reading those primary sources coming up with the questions they have to kind of come back at the question that I'm giving them to, you know, to think about for through the whole week. And that right there is going to promote discussion and debate. And you tell the students, make them understand that there's no right or wrong answer. It's just trying to understand what it is. And if it's something that is a problem in society, well, why is it a problem? And how do we best address it? So that's, that's what we do at the secondary ed level. Um, but again, and, and this kind of goes back to uh, something else I wanted to bring up, doing history with the public. I think 
to even get to that point, I think the classroom at this level is very important to lay a foundation for mm -hmm. then bringing students up into that world of public history. And I think it's going to lead us into Coven's uh, second principle of broadening the meaning of doing history. What exactly is doing history? Uh, prior to really immersing myself in the public history world, which I have to thank Susan for, I never really kind of did. I had just gone the academic route. But when you really get into the world of public history, and now we're giving it a name, I would have never thought of a Socratic seminar as really doing history, you know, that we're just kind of reading it. But as we kind of come into this new 21st century perspective, uh, maybe, maybe even it's a gray area, but maybe we can say a Socratic seminar going through those primary documents with students, teaching them how to analyze those documents. To some degree, that could be a foundation for doing history. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And I think that this gets at a lot of interesting questions about uh, doing history with the public. I mean, what you were talking about with the Confederate monuments, I mean, I, I teach this um, chapter by David Blight, which is about the lost mm. cause. And he gets, he goes back to the creation of these monuments, especially in Richmond. And um, it was all, I mean, the, the people who did this is like 1890 something, the people who were celebrating it, they they just came right out and said, this is about white supremacy. They used those words specifically. And they said, this is a celebration of the reestablishment of white supremacy in the South. I mean, they weren't shy about it either. So, um, you know, yeah, I mean, you can see that they've been up for a very long time and it only makes sense that when there's a real challenge to white supremacy, that those monuments would also be challenged because that, that was the point. Right. And yeah. we know it because they they actually said it. Right. Which is kind of unusual. You know, usually people kind of hide things, but I guess they just sort of felt like there's no challenge. So let's just, you know, say the thing that's on everybody's mind and just say it out loud. Uh, so. So, yeah, I mean, it definitely is something that needs to be discussed. And and, you know, um, also, I was thinking, too, with this question of doing uh, history with the public. I mean, are there you know, are there limits to that? And one of the things right. that came to my mind would be the people who are still believers in the lost cause. There are still a lot of people who are true believers in the lost cause and who uh, are still in line with, with all the stuff uh, that was said and, and when, whenever that was, 1890 something in, in Richmond uh, and, you know, trying to do kind of public history with that group of people, I think could be, really difficult, especially if you're kind of trying to present it as some kind of, I, I don't know, accurate reflection, uh, you would have to, you would have to frame it in such a way that would make clear that you're not, you know, endorsing it. But even by presenting it, aren't you spreading it too? So I guess that's, that's my question is what, what are the limits of doing history with the public? Um, what, what the limit think? the you know, limit is that it's with the public that's mm. that's that's literally the limit it's the the paradox um because you do have to deal with very difficult topics um and a lot of people don't want to accept certain problems um some people don't want to accept kind of the role um that you know they may be contributing to to problems so yeah, I think the limit in itself is the fact that we're trying to communicate to a large group of people. Um, and I think that's part of part of the burden and part of our job to try to figure out. On one hand, it's, you know, if you're talking about it, are you spreading it? Um, but at the same time, there's also the sense of duty or mission where um, at some point, we're going to have to drop all of our swords and kind of meet people where they're at, regardless of what their ideology may be, um, mm -hmm. and really try to um, have these informed discussions. I think social media has made it very hard for us to make everyone a, 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 you know, a caricature of themselves. Um, I think it's, you know, 
you can reply to tweets all day, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're having a discussion. Um, and sometimes once the going gets really tough with a really hard topic, especially having to do with the white supremacy and someone who may be holding on to it in a, in a particular way, um, I think it's going to be up to us to try to um, kind of <laughs> somewhat think less of ourselves and try to meet people where they are which is like hey we need to have this discussion um because there's a reason why they think the way that they think too um so it's you know it's really hard to make those decisions um because we we have to go through that discomfort too um so i think that's going to be an open discussion among us as we continue um, kind of going with this series where, you know, what what are the limits, what are the pitfalls, and how do we actually approach it in a way where we're not causing harm? You know, it, it's funny to go back to something Susan mentioned. You mentioned David Blight. He did a great uh, discussion with Annette Gordon-Reed back in the early days of the pandemic on debating and removing monuments. And he had an interesting point. You know, what if our monuments became just generational items, you know, and, you know, they kind of get reevaluated every generation. Is it still reflective of the society we are really trying to create and, and build on? So it was a very interesting discussion. And he had brought up uh, an example of the Emancipation Monument down in DC. <laughs> and, you know, that has also come under scrutiny you know, why is, why do you have Abraham Lincoln, a white man standing over, um, you know, an African-American man who was, looked like he was going down to his knees. And when you read the history of the monument, it's to show that the shackles were broken and he's actually coming off from his knees to be eye to eye with Lincoln. But again, here we are, you know, a hundred years later from when that monument went up, maybe more. And maybe that needs to be a reevaluated. And that was the point he was trying to make. Or the Statue of Liberty. It's yeah. actually about the end of slavery. There are shackles that yeah. are broken behind her and it's just completely not been remembered that way. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's kind of had a different kind of uh, connotation. Yeah. Um, so I guess the question is, you know, two different kind of questions. How do you do history with the public that might not want to do history with you. Uh, and then the opposite mm. might be, you know, what if you're doing history with the public that you don't want to do history with? Um, you know, and Carlos is saying, no, you have to, you have to be willing to be working with all different kinds of publics, which I think is is definitely right. Um, it's just, I wonder, uh, I wonder how to do it. You know, it's just it's, my, yeah. it's not easy. Like it's it's you know, I've lived a relatively, you know, privileged, privileged life in that I've lived in New York City my whole life, or at least the grand majority of it. And, you know, living in East Harlem in the Bronx, most of the people around me looked like me. Um, a lot of the people that I went to, to school with, the grand majority looked like me. Um, so, my, although I experienced racism as a child, I didn't necessarily experience it in my neighborhood, in my community. Um, but once I had to go off to college and I had to go off to, um, you know, the suburbs of Buffalo, um, I had to kind of tackle certain misconceptions, uh, you know, about being Black and being Latino and being, you know, all, all of these different identities. Um, and in that, at least I found myself talking a lot about history um, and trying to talk about it in a way where um, I'm not letting their words um, hurt me. Mm. Um, and that was very hard, uh, you know, because some people were genuinely speaking in such a way, um, you know, because that's all they had been taught. They may be seen one person of color their entire life. So what they were telling me wasn't necessarily, you know, to spite me or say something terrible to me. They just didn't know. Mm -hmm. um, so 
I, I, I have to say that that experience for me as like, as hard as that was, it informs how I, I tackle public history, um, at least with people that don't necessarily want to do it with me or vice versa. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's, those are definitely things that I've had to juggle throughout uh, my career to get where I am today. So you mean it's kind of a process and even though the process is painful, you have to go through it. Is, is that more? Uh, yeah, I think it's, it's us. We're already dealing with very uncomfortable topics to begin with. Um, but at the same time, um, part of the discomfort is having intense conversations um, and experiencing pushback. Um, and, and that's really just a fact of it all is that we're going to feel that particular pushback, um, no matter what it is that we're trying to accomplish. Because um, even something is, as important as that 126th Street African burial ground, there is pushback, even though there is, you know, overwhelming evidence that, you know, this should be preserved and memorialized. So um, I think it's up to us to try to reevaluate um, not just the limits, but also the, um, the obstacles that we have to confront. Um, and part of that is trying to um, have conversations with folks that are either not familiar with the issue or have completely different views that may be skewed for you know a, a bevy of other reasons. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah. public history takes courage. That's one of the things that you're saying. I mean, it, it, it takes courage and you know just to pass it on to um, Joe, and I'm sure you can get into this too. Um, there's also another aspect of it uh, that kind of circles back to for the public because um, there is there are certain histories that are much harder to delve into than others because of the subject matter. Um, but some of them can be very hard due to methodology. Um, and what I mean by that is when I took a, you know, I take, I give a lot of credit to my uh, Chinese history professor, uh, Andrew Myers at, at Brooklyn College. Um, think I wouldn't even be, you know, a decent historian without taking his pre-modern and modern, you know, China courses. Um, but his pre-modern China class in, in specific was so hard. Um, and at that time, you know, I was trying to figure out um, how I could incorporate, you know, my classes as public history. And going through that course made me realize you know, how hard it could be depending on uh, the sources that we have available. Um, you know, pre-modern China is a very hard thing to research, whether it's regarding language or the limited sources, it gets very difficult. So how do we engage the public with, um, you know, with topics that are just seem to be far beyond the grasp of uh, what people imagine that we do. So I think that's also a part of like whether or not you should, you know, pick and choose which public you're trying to engage. Absolutely. Well, uh, we're trying to engage as large of a public as we possibly can with this podcast. So hopefully you found it interesting and you'll want to hear more. Uh, we'll be releasing other podcasts throughout the summer and beyond into the next academic year. And we hope to have you join us again. So thank you for uh, listening and uh, thank you from all of us. All right. Thanks.